Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Corey Stengel. Um, my paying job is I'm an industrial hygiene consultant with Oregon OSHA. I've been to a few grows and process, processing of both hemp and uh, marijuana, or just I'll just say cannabis. On, on a other hat I wear, I'm a, the vice president of Deschutes County Farm Bureau, and I'm also the safety and health chair of Oregon Farm Bureau, which, which or, the Farm Bureau has, uh, in the last few years, become actively involved in the cannabis industry since it became a legal crop. So um, any time throughout this presentation, uh, feel free to ask any questions you may have. Um, I want to keep this as informal as possible, and and we can all learn something here. Um, I have a small farm in Central Oregon and uh, we grew hemp in it last year. That's a picture of it. So I, I got to watch the, the process and here's where we're harvesting. We used combines. We lopped them off and combined them up. So uh, just to give you an idea of what I got to watch all summer. So um, today we're going to do a brief overview of how Oregon OSHA works, the programs that Oregon OSHA has that apply to you and, and where to find them, and a quick overview of the required trainings o Oregon OSHA requires, and the top 10 hazards found in your industry. So out of all this stuff, I'm not going to delve into any one program, but it's essentially going to be where you can find more information to enhance your program or create a program. So, um, growing cannabis has been around forever and a day, um, but it just seems to be recently Oregon OSHA has gotten interested, and that's primarily because cannabis became a legal agricultural crop. And once, once it became a legal agricultural crop in Oregon, it, it, it falls under Oregon OSHA's jurisdiction. So what we've seen, we've seen the uh, old time growers kind of under the, under, under cover, the, the illegal grows, moving into legal grows, but they're bringing their old habits, which, which not, they aren't necessarily, um, compliant with Oregon OSHA rules. Um, and there's also this jurisdiction. Does OSHA have jurisdiction over your growth? So this is kind of an important slide to go over for a little bit. Um, where's that button there? Um, are you guys consider yourself independent contractors, sole proprietors, partners? And if these criteria um, fall into your bailiwick, then you'd be covered by Oregon OSHA. So if you, if you have workers' compensation coverage for your employees, um, if, if the um, contractors, regardless of whether or not they have workers' comp, are working for you, then they have whole other issues of non-complying. Or when you have two or more working on the same job, performing the same task, and one has direct control of the others. Um, more likely, you're a LLC or a corporation that you formed. Um, and there, there's some common misconceptions. Well, if I'm the officer, I'm not. But you actually can be. And, and when, so these, when these companies have officers who are exposed to the same hazards, as their employees or when owners, officer, officers are covered by workers' comp, they can be cited for violations by Oregon OSHA. And then the, one of the most confusing parts about it is the corporate family farms. Um, OSHA defines what a family member is, not, not here, but in our, uh, in our uh, web page we do, but um, if they're non-family members or extended family members, they, they could be a subject employee, as OSHA likes to call them. Then there's also the 51% rule. Um, if you're, especially if you're processing on your farm, if you're growing 
more than 51% of your product you're processing, then you fall under the uh, agricultural rules, which I'll delve into in a second. If you're processing less than 51% on your farm, then the division two or general industry rules uh, come into play. And um, you see the division two and division four, and, and what that means is um, Oregon OSHA has a total of seven divisions in their rules from the general administrative rules, which covers um, safety committees, how Oregon OSHA has the right to be on your place, um, the general rules, hence the general administrative. Division two, which covers almost everything. It's, it's um, general um, safety and health rules for general industry from schools to foundries to um, could be an ag operation if, if you're bringing in more product than you're growing. Division three focuses just on construction. Division four, which is highlighted, is what we're gonna focus on today, the ag, assuming that you're, uh, you're growing 51% or more of your product that you're processing. Division five maritime, which would, would deal with the ports. And division seven, out in the woods. Um, and division four codes, codes are uh, further broken down in a bunch of alphabets. So it, it covers a lot of different areas. Um, and uh, oh, there we go, hit the wrong button. So you'll, you'll see stuff from emergency access, first aid, fire, ele electric, welding, and um, what you'll notice here, these, again, these are the agricultural rules and, the, and subdivision two, the general industry rules, you'll see there's a lot of similarity. There's welding, there's walking, working surfaces, there's, there's um, emergency uh, medical first aid, fire protection. So a lot of the rules for each division are the same, but they're just categorized differently depending on uh, what kind of uh, industry you're, you fall under. And the place to find all this stuff, this is our website. I encourage you to, uh, to take note of that because this makes the 80 plus thousand rules OSHA has a little easier to navigate. Um, so if you click on those websites, I encourage you to go to the A to Z topic list. And what that is is, okay, I wanna know more about ladders. After you click on that, you hit L, ladders will pop up and everything OSHA has on ladders will be at your fingertips. Um, I'll back up again here. There's also a section just on rules and laws. Um, what happens during inspections, and if you've been inspected, your rights. Um, safety conferences, grant programs are available that people have taken advantage of. Online classroom, because I mentioned the training um, required. OSHA provides the ability to get the OSHA required training you need. And again, so back to the A to Z thing, I hit A, and this is what the um, agricultural front page of our website looks like. And um, again, you'll see it has, you can filter by publications, the education part, rules, videos, and additional material. So again, it's all at your fingertips and makes it really handy. We also have what's called the PESO program. If you have Spanish speaking em employees and you, you need to train them on all this OSHA required stuff, you can, you can find it in Spanish. And the way it's, it's organized you print off this material and, and you open the book and on the left side is the English version and on the right side is the Spanish version so you know exactly what you're telling them or what you're showing them so there's, there's, there, you don't get lost in interpretations. So again, if you have Spanish speaking employees, this is a great place to go. And again, it's all right here. So, um, 
if you remember back what the uh, ag rules showed, these 10 top sided, which we'll go over again, are actual subdivisions in those rules. So, so um, they are covered. Um, and even though they're spelled out relatively nicely, these still are the areas that folks have the uh, most problem maintaining. And, and a lot of it, like record keeping and hazard communication, things like that take um, some administrative uh, work. So you can set it up and have it all compliant, but if you forget about it, it goes to non-compliance, and then and if the OSHA folks show up, they're going to look to see how well they're managed. So those are the main things. So um, out of the division for ag rules, the programs that you must have, start with record keeping, um, Site orientation, sanitation, that's mainly if you have employees working on your site or you bring people on your site. Everyone who has employees is going to require to have a safety meeting or a safety committee. Um, if you provide personal protective equipment, there needs to be some kind of assessment to make sure they're wearing the proper protective equipment. If you're providing respirators, there's a program for that too. Hearing protection, um, confined space entry, depending on uh, how involved your farm is, from, from, and, and the, one of the latest pushes is heat stress. That Oregon OSHA um, has a focus on addressing heat stress from May to October, so if, if they're working out in the fields in the summer, that's going to be an important one to have. And. Um, Another main aspect of, of the Ag Rule is uh, WPS, Worker Protection Standard. And um, my colleague Garnett, she's going to dive deep into WPS, respirators, HAZCOM, and pesticides. Once again, I'm just touching on what's required and where you can find it. And what I did, you're going to see a lot of pictures of our publications. I, I brought them for you to actually see them. And at our booth, we have a lot of these as well so that you can pick up. So um, tomorrow at 1.30, you can uh, come and see Garnett and, and learn more about those areas. She's, she's OSHA's uh, pesticide guru, so she'll be able to answer any questions you have on that. So to start off record keeping, um, if you have an injury and illness, um, on the farm and you have employees, you have to fill out an OSHA 300. And, um, and it kind of looks like this, what OSHA provides. And then there's a summary log that has to be posted at the from February to 1st of April. And again, here's some of the publications that Oregon OSHA has that can help you find that. And again, on our website, you hit R for record keeping, and, and this stuff will pop up for you. Um, the next one is you have hand labor out in the workplace. The requirement is to uh, give them a side orientation, make sure you have a proper uh, toilet, proper number, and, and clean toilets, washing facilities, and uh, drinking water. And, um, in the site orientation, you want to orientate and make sure they know where they're supposed to be, know, know the uh, hazards they're expected to encounter, tell them where they don't need to be, um, and who to report to if they identify something that's a safety and health uh, concern. And here's a picture of some of the documents that Oregon OSHA has for you to help you with this, um, from field sanitation, hand labor, to uh, if they're working around hazardous chemicals, that's required. And again, a lot of these are in Spanish as well. Um, and there's even videos that associate with those. And again, 
these fact sheets will just outline and spell out exactly what you need to do so hopefully there's no question when, when you, after you read these things. And if you have employees in Oregon, in Oregon, it's required you have either a safety meeting or a safety committee. And um, depending on how many employees you have um, will we'll determine if you can have a meeting or a committee. So a, a common uh, piece of confusion is, okay, our farm we have four employees for nine months out of the year, but there's three months where we bring in crews and we'll have 50 or 60 employees. Where do I fall? And the rule says that if any time during the year you have more than 10, you need to have a safety committee. Um, and again, these are one of the administrative rules Oregon OSHA has that most people will take the time and set it up and it'll look beautiful, but over time it, it, um, it gets, uh, forgotten or or ignore no I won't say ignore mainly forgotten and elements like the regular training or the meetings fall through the cracks especially when you're busy um, and again Oregon OSHA will show up at the most inconvenient time which is any time um, and I work for them but uh and they'll ask for your records your minutes um, your committee members and if, if you can uh, produce them, there's a potential uh, citation attached. And, and these records have to be kept for three years, that, so you gotta have a good filing system. And, and there's a little chart to, to help you decide if you can have a committee or, a, or just have meetings. So, um, but the magic t number is 10 for the entire year is essentially what it is. And again, Oregon OSHA provides a bunch of information on how to, uh, how to set up this committee, the, the format of the, what the agenda should look like, what the meeting minutes should look like, how often um, can you have a centralized committee, which means you have farms and or grows in a number of locations. You don't necessarily need to have a committee for each location. It can all come together at the main office. So again, real good information. So um, the next one would be uh, personal protective equipment. This is one of the more cited ones because someone shows up for work, here's your gloves, here's your goggles, um, the fields out there. There's a little more thought process required by OSHA than that. You gotta figure out what the hazard they're gonna be exposed to, how you're gonna protect them from that hazard, and there needs to be, a, a, for lack of better words, documented or certified that you've done this so it's it's really not too detailed it's okay you're going to be uh, picking bud therefore you, we want you to wear gloves and these are the type of gloves that um we found that that are best suited for the job and um you just keep the employees in, involved in that process by uh making sure that they're comfortable for them, they're not gonna break out. If you have folks that are, have allergies to latex or other rubbers, make sure that uh, you, you take that into account. And um, there's a number of resources other than Oregon OSHA out there. Uh, 3M, 3M does a good job of identifying the potential hazards they may be exposed to and how to protect them from that and um, when I say personal protective equipment, I'm not talking about respirators because respirators it, it's, it has a, their own program because there's so much involved with uh, respiratory protection. So this is mainly dealing with uh, eye hand protection. And hearing protection is a little different too. It has its own rules because 
there, there's a little more involved with uh, the lungs and the ears than just protecting the, the skin. And um, so right into respirators, if you're providing respirators, there's either you're providing them for actual protection from a chemical or dust, or you're providing for comfort, so you're, you're or providing them for protection from the product so they're not sneezing or coughing on the product. And for the one where you're protecting from a chemical, there's a whole bunch of stuff required from fit testing, medical evaluations, um, making sure they fit properly, they're stored properly, the, the cartridges are changed out when they're supposed to. But the voluntary side, the, the requirements are, are honed down tremendously. It's essentially what we call in the industry Appendix D, which is appendix in our rule that says you're going to store this in a clean fashion and you're going to maintain it in a, a usable fashion. So, um, but you need to know for sure that the respirator is just being used for comfort rather than uh, protection from a chemical themselves. So here's some pictures of what we routinely see. This is what we like to see. Um, this is not where it's stored among chemicals, but if it's stored in its own container, that, that's um, good. And again, Oregon Ocean provides a, a number of resources that will help you develop uh, an effective compliant respiratory protection program. And um, depending what you have going on on your farm, if you have noisy equipment, you may need to have a hearing protection program. Oregon OSHA starts regulating uh, noisy areas at 85 decibels for an eight hour time weighted average. And the best way to, uh, well nowadays, if you have a smartphone, they have uh, sound level meter apps. Uh, NIOSH, N-I-O-S-H, has one that is very accurate. If you, take, if you pull up those apps and <clears throat> measure the equipment that you have concerns with, and they're at 85 or higher, and you know they're gonna be working around that equipment for a full day, um, a hearing protection program is strongly advised. And the, the threshold limit of 85 drops as the uh, workday increases. So if they're working 10, 12 hour days, that level goes down to 83 to 80, 80 something. It's a mathematical equation, but uh, it, it drops, just so you know. Um, and another way to tell is, if you have to stand about three feet away from someone and raise your voice for them to be heard, the surrounding noise is in the 85 decibel range. And um, the only fine stuff like that with your equipment, older equipment seems to be louder than newer equipment. Well-maintained equipment is a lot quieter than equipment that may be rattling or, or hasn't been greased in a while. So maintaining the equipment you have it's not only good for the equipment, but it also will help reduce the noise. And again, um, here's some of the documents Oregon OSHA has to help you uh, with the noise issues you may have. And because this was on the list of programs you may need, if you have confined spaces, um, you will need a confined space program, and confined space has to be limited entry, not designed for continuous occupancy. And, and um, so silos are, are one of the most common. Um, if there's any pits or vats that you have to enter, those are, those are conf considered confined spaces too. Yes, sir?
Yeah, the question was if, um, if a warehouse has one access point, is that considered a confined space? The criteria there's, that have to be met is, is it um, easily accessible? In other words, if it's just a door and you can walk in and walk out, it's not a confined space, but if it's a hatch that's even a couple feet off the ground where you have to contort your body to get in or out, then it would be a confined space. So, yeah, there's, um, yeah, if this only had one exit, it's designed for human occupancy. That's, that's a key term in the whole confined space scenario. So, um, it could be an enclosed space, which doesn't make it a confined space. And another big one, these, are, these two seem to kill more people on, in an industry than anyone. If they're not locking out and people entering confined spaces without testing the atmosphere or knowing what they're getting into. And the lockout tagout, that, that applies to the equipment you're using. If there's um, any kind of electrical, pneumatic, uh, gravity, any energy that is stored in any of the equipment, it has to be isolated or released and locked out so it can't be reactivated while they're working in it. So lockout is a big, a big rule as far as um, if you get caught with uh, inadequate lockout, um, that can result in some big fines because it usually ends up in someone getting seriously hurt or dying. And that's another programmatic issue that you can take the time at the front end and have a beautiful program, but then over time things get forgotten and it kind of falls apart because that rule requires an annual evaluation of the equipment you need to lock out to make sure nothing has changed, a valve wasn't moved, that needs to be shut off, it was here, now it's over there, just to make sure that everything is still the way it was intended to be. And again, um, there's some booklets available to help you with that. Uh, so there's no reason to um, create the wheel again. And, and along with these booklets, back to our A to Z list and our website, OSHA provides sample programs for almost all this stuff. So they've created a format and it's essentially fill in your blank and that will put you in compliance, minimal compliance, but it'll put you in compliance. But we always encourage you to tailor it to meet your specific needs. And um, again on there, required programs is the worker protection standard and, and Garnett will, will do a deeper dive into that tomorrow. So I'm just making you aware that OSHA has information on this as well from from your worker protection standard to um, storing of agricultural chemicals. And um, again, heat stress during the months of uh, May to October, if you get visited by Oregon OSHA, this is one of the things they're gonna ask if you have a heat injury prevention plan. And it's not only just for the solar load that, that the workers may be exposed to out in the field. If they're required to wear uh, protective gear. exactly protective gear, something that's encapsulated in their body like Tyvek, something that will keep their body heat close to them, um, then uh, it will apply. And again, um, OSHA has a lot of good information and they also, yes sir. That will, the question was, does the heat protection um, apply to indoor grows? If you have excessive heat, you should at least uh, train your uh, folks on, on what heat exhaustion feels like. Uh, hopefully they don't, um, signs of heat stroke and um, make them familiar with the heat stress table 
So if, if um, they are wearing a bunch of PPE to protect the plants from them, it could be. If, if, if their body temperature is rising, even though the climate's controlled, there, there may be a need. That, that'll depend on, um, on, on your specific operation, but, but it's something good to cover with them. Um, if you guys weld out there, um, we also have a good information on um, welding from gas welding to regular burnout. If you're welding on stainless steel, we have a specific rule on hexavalent chromium, which is a byproduct of uh, welding on stainless steel. And one that almost always shows up in any inspection is the hazard communication program. Employees right to know what chemicals they're handling in the workplace. And it's more not having the program but not maintaining it. And that's a, another one that requires vigilance to keep it in compliance. And again, um, we have a lot of good information on that. And, and we also have a sample program that can be used and um, get into eye washes. If you have employees exposed to chemicals that can damage the eye, eye washes would be required. Um, and also, Garnett will get into this. It's focused primarily on um, what the label of the product says if, if um, you need that stuff. Oops, sorry. And again, we have uh, stuff on pesticide use and First protective equipment, which we'll hear more about tomorrow. And again, a fact sheet on what's expected of an eye wash if you're going to have an eye wash. Also, I'm sure you'll find at least one ladder on any of your farms. Um, there's a non complying cat right there. but So there is requirements for ladder safety because, especially in the construction industry, ladders. Uh, kill more people than falling off roofs because working on ladders can be a hazard. And again, because of that, there's app, apps that you can find on your phone about ladder safety, uh, walking working surfaces fact sheet on, on what's expected at working ele at elevations and, and even a portable ladder. And, um, and unfortunately, this day of age, day and age is uh, violence in the workplace. And, and not only um, being robbed, but uh, uh, issues with uh, spouses or boyfriends, girlfriends coming on site and uh, uh, bringing their home spouse to the workplace, knowing how to uh, contend with those situations, a lot of communication with, with your employees. And, um, OSHA doesn't have a specific rule on violence in the workplace, but they recognize the hazards that are, that are out there, so they created a, a nice booklet to help address with that. And ergonomics, it's another one OSHA doesn't have a specific rule on, but they recognize there's a, a number of issues associated with a, a poor body mechanics from, from working with buds to, to a cutting the plants, and, um, and again, they have a number of uh, resources, and, and there's even a, NIOSH has some resources, and they did a study on a farm in Washington and created this uh, document. And some other, uh, Helpful documents if you have a farm. I helped write that one because I'm a volunteer firefighter, but if your farm catches on fire for whatever reason, you know you're going to go out and try to put it out and it just gives you some ideas on how to do it in a safer manner. Be and, and this, this um, booklet kind of summarizes everything I've talked about in a, a nice little booklet. So there, there's a lot out there. and. The big change in, in our posting for pesticides came a couple years ago. So we used to require this poster. Now it looks like this. So if you're applying pesticides, you'll need to
Make sure you have that. And um, here's some other postings. A good idea to manage these postings is to uh, consolidate them in an area you know the employees are going to be. Um, we covered most of these areas already, and um, but there's a quick list. I'm kind of running out of time, so I'm racing through these. But this kind of lists out the required postings that uh, would be needed for ag, and, and again, uh, we covered a lot of these, and, and yeah, there's the voluntary use of respirators, the appendix, and the, the other posters and, and emergency response procedures, et cetera. And again, here's some ideas on where and how you could post these things if you have a central location where you know they'll see it. And some of the required trainings um, from pesticide handling to uh, emergency plans, what to do in the event they have to leave the workplace in a hurry. And again, all those booklets that we flashed up there, you can find these requirements. Yes, sir. Um, not by Oregon. The question was, are there HAZWOPER trainings tailored to the cannabis industry? Um, Oregon OSHA has a HAZWOPER rule, and um, you have to fit the criteria before it applies. So Oregon OSHA doesn't, doesn't make them for specific industries. You just have to see where you fit in the rule. There may be other companies out there that have done that for you, but um, Oregon OSHA doesn't do that. Um, so the top side of Oregon OSHA rules, I'll, I'll go through these really quick in the, and stop me if you want to chat about any of them because we're kind of, I've been long-winded here. So record keeping, it involves the most obvious, the huge accidents, um, tractor roll over ATV, but first aid, um, if you can take care of it yourself, that's not recordable. A bee sting, that's considered something you can't get over the counter, so if someone needs to use an EpiPen on your site, that's, a, that's beyond first aid, therefore it needs to be recorded. And, and again, the uh, documents that will help you navigate all that. Site orientation, sanitation, make sure they uh, are aware of the power lines that they may be working around. If there's any hazards like ponds, if they need to stay away. Um, equipment hazards they may be associated with, and of course the, uh, the uh, toilet facilities, washing facilities, and, and, and if there's any chemical areas they need to be aware of to either take the right precautions or just stay away. And again, the uh, information that OSHA provides Safety committees, that's another one of the top 10, making sure you have a safety meeting or committee. And again, that's one of the maintenance things that usually gets cited. And um, it can be as informal as around the tractor or the sprayer or, or to a formal sit down, and, uh, but they need to be documented. And, and these documents help you uh, figure out what kind of agenda and, and minutes you need to take. Personal protective equipment, not just handing it out, but make sure you're providing the right equipment for the right, right task, making sure it fits the employer right, they're not allergic to the gloves, or so there's a little more thought into it rather than here's your, here's your glasses and gloves. And again, uh, more, more information on it, and, and respiratory protection, Again, PPE and respiratory protection will be dealt with in way more detail tomorrow with Garnett, but I wanted to let you know that that's something that o Oregon OSHA focuses on. If you have them on your site, they'll ask you a lot of questions. And again, the uh, information we have to help you with that. And a big one is the housekeeping that can easily get away with get away because of uh, working on what your, the, the 
task at hand. It's easy to set something down, I'll get back to it later and not. And uh, that's one thing the uh, compliance officer will look for is easy access through aisleways. So there's no tripping hazards, slipping hazards, making sure things are stored in a safe manner. And these are just some pictures of what we see out there. Um, and again, these can be addressed through, through a number of different fashions. Safety committee is the best way with the uh, routine inspections they do. That could be top on their list to make sure that's uh, being done. Emergency action plans. What do you want your employees to do in, in the event of someone gets seriously hurt, storms or fires? Do you want to shelter in place, meet in a certain area, make sure you have someone designated to make the call that they need to call or contact the right person. This needs to be uh, spelled out. Um, again, we got some good information to help you with that. Fire extinguisher, it's another one of the top sided. Having a fire extinguisher is one thing, maintaining it's a whole nother thing from the monthly visual inspections, making sure the key's in there, making sure there's nothing uh, impeding it. Um, access, oh dang it, hit the wrong button again. Access, making sure it's mounted like that one, that one, um, making sure it's readily accessible. This would be a good spot right by an exit so they can decide either to leave the building or turn around and squirt something on it, but the fact that the freezer's there makes access to it a little more difficult, so that's something that would get looked at. And again, our fact sheet covers all those things. Electrical, um, that's another one we typically find all the time since the, uh, the lighting fans are always moving, especially in greenhouses. Um, using an a extension cord isn't illegal, but using it wrong is, and these are just some examples of how people have, have used extension cords and other wiring to fulfill their temporary needs. Um, so something to be aware of, and again, the information we have to help you manage that as well. And then hazard communication, again, will be more detailed tomorrow, but making sure you're Chemicals have safety data sheets, are labeled. Um, you train the employees on the hazards associated with them. They, they're able to find the safety data sheet if they want to find out more about it. If they spill it, they need to know what to do. Um, secondary container labeling is, is, oh, don't have it, is the big one. Because um, we'll always find something in a spray bottle that's just marked. Um, with a word or no word, or it was marked and it's smudged off and you can't read it. So that's something that's always uh, identified in an inspection. So um, since I'm cons part of the consultation program, I want to let you know and invite you all to call us. The consultation program, even though it's part of Oregon OSHA, is a free confidential service. What's that mean? It means you've essentially paid for it other fashions through workers' comp insurance, but there is no direct cost of calling us out. And confidential part means we don't tell anyone. Um, enforcement won't know where we're at. Um, the only way they will find out is if they sh happen to show up for another reason. And then um, there's some criteria on who gets to stay. If, if they're addressing a complaint, the, the consultants have to leave. If they're on a scheduled inspection, they have to leave, and then you have a 60-day window to correct things before you're back on an inspection list. Um, and um, how it works, you either get on the website, make a request, call one of our offices. We take an intake, essentially saying what kind of services do you would you like, and, and it goes into our backlog. You'll receive a letter saying, thank you for requesting our services, a consultant will be contacting you. And then um, it's kind of like a 
a movie ticket, it's first come, first serve, that backlog is divided into our different regions and as you come to the top or if it's something that needs immediate attention, that gets bumped up with manager approval, but then they'll call you up, set a mutually agreed upon time and come and visit and, uh, and uh, address any issues you have. So. Um, Thank you for your time. Uh, come and visit us at our booth. That's not the booth here. That's an old booth, but um, it's number 218. Oops. Oops. I think my time's almost up, but are there any questions, comments, concerns? Um, if you want to talk more, I'll be down at the booth the rest of today and tomorrow and with my colleagues. Uh, a lot of these publications are there for you to pick up. Um, they didn't bring them all, but this, this, these are essentially the ones that were up on the screen if you want to take a look at those. But other than that, I appreciate you uh, spending this morning with me, and thanks for coming. <laughs>